Welcome to the Keeping It Israel podcast with Jeff Feuders, where Jeff and his guests talk everything Israel as it relates to Christian faith and the church. If you are a Christian and you stand with Israel, you will be encouraged and challenged by this podcast. And if you're not so sure about the whole Israel thing, you need to learn how your faith connects with Israel and why standing with Israel matters. Now here's Jeff with today's guest. Well, welcome to the podcast today. And uh, my name is Jeff. I'm your host. And my guest today is Reverend James Canelon. And uh, I have known Pastor Canelon for some time. Actually, I knew your dad uh, briefly. Your dad preached my father-in-law's funeral. I don't know if I ever told you that before, but uh, Homer was just a, a great sort of looming presence in many of our lives in Western Ontario District of the PAOC. But uh, Anyhow, Jim is our guest today. Jim has uh, a great story, and I'm not going to tell it to you because I know that he wants to do that. So, uh, Jim, first of all, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks, Jeff. It's it's great to be with you on this podcast and to be a part of that big media universe out there that just seems to get bigger and bigger as we breathe. Absolutely. And you're very familiar with that. And I know that uh, we'll, we'll share a little bit about that as we move forward. I want to uh, talk in the beginning here about sort of the uh, original call to head to Israel and start a congregation in the city of Jerusalem. Um, tell us just a little bit about, first of all, how did that all come about? Um, you know, it would take me a good hour to, to do justice to the story, so I'll, I'll give you the Reader's Digest condensed version here. Mm -hmm. um, I was pastoring just north of Toronto. We had just built a new church called Cedarview Community Church, and the place was booming. I had about 800 people and uh, all young families. It was, it was terrific. Um, but in the process of doing this, um, uh, a broadcast entity in Toronto, one of the big stations who knew about me, uh, one of their vice presidents was involved in building a small radio station in southern Lebanon for a Christian organization out of California called High Adventure. And um, they were under great threat from um, the PLO in southern Lebanon. Uh, the um, um, There was a an old crusader castle called uh, Beaufort Castle, just up above this little abandoned customs house they'd made the station in. And they were shelling from Beaufort Castle down into the valley and trying to hit the station. And, uh, the staff were very, very stressed and they needed a break. And so uh, they contacted me and asked me if I would come over and relieve these beleaguered people for three weeks. Mm. Knowing full well that I was going into a battle zone, there would be tanks and mortars and, you know, uh, aircraft and all kinds of things that would be surrounding me. But I, I sensed from the Lord I should do it. You know, I, you know, I had just, I had this fantastic new church and a uh, uh, very young family, uh, three little kids. But my sense from the Lord was that this was his calling and I should do it. Uh, and it was, uh, I suppose it was risky, um, but, you know, I, I've never been one to be risk averse. At the same time, I don't believe in being um, irresponsible, but I do ride a motorcycle. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, while I was there in southern Lebanon, uh, and one night when I was under duress, and I thought maybe I was going to die that night, in southern Lebanon, broadcasting from this little abandoned customs house uh, with this little radio station, I really had an encounter with the Lord about uh, uh, coming to Israel with uh, young people at that point from Canada who would provide volunteer um, work for the various kibbutzim in Israel that were always in need of volunteers. Mm -hmm. And um, so while I was, when, when I was back in Canada, I was promoting this idea with the churches across the nation. The response was so phenomenal that I had to go back to Israel to set up what we call Kibbutz Shalom. And um, it's interesting how these things uh, converged, but uh, the government wanted to talk to me about this. Um, 
Yeah, I've often been asked why, and I think it's because it happened to be at a period in time back in 1981 when Israel needed friends, and they knew that I represented the Assemblies of God in Canada, and that that was about 11 or 1,200 churches who were uh, very supportive of Israel. Mm -hmm. So they saw me as a friend. Uh, but they also had done their homework on me. I, I didn't realize till much later that, you know, there's no intelligence like Israeli intelligence. That's exactly <laughs> they, right. They, uh, they, yeah. they, knew me, they knew me better than I knew myself. Anyhow, in a meeting where I had uh, officials from the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of Religion, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, they were questioning me and having me make my presentation. And uh, uh, it was in that setting that they made the suggestion. They said, um, you know, Jim, this is a very good idea, this Kibbutz Shalom, but you cannot be coordinating it from your, from Toronto. You must to be here in Yerushalayim. And there was a the pause. And uh, then they said, then, um, would you consider establishing an international church in Yerushalayim? Mm -hmm. well, it's a good thing I was sitting down. I mean, I, who would ever expect that? I mean, that's something you couldn't even pray about. Yeah. Uh, it was just one of those, one of those divine moments. And uh, of course I said, yes, uh, Kathy was with me and she kicked me under the table, but I mean, uh, that's not the last thing she put <laughs> under the table, but you know, we, we just, we had just dedicated our new church. Um, I had this young family, little three little kids, seven, five, and three uh, years of age. I'm going to pick up and, and, and move to this foreign country with foreign language that has a strong um, sensitivity to uh, Christianity. Anyhow, long story short, we, we made the move in November of 81. And uh, for the next year and a half, uh, we just basically worked at being, becoming enculturated. I ran the Kibbutz Shalom program and bringing young people over to live and work as volunteers. Kathy and I got into um, Hebrew studies at the Hebrew University. And our oldest uh, child, who, who was seven years of age at the time, in December, we put him into the local uh, uh, um, elementary school, David and Paula Ben-Gurion Elementary School. Hmm. Uh, he didn't know a word of Hebrew. And the uh, principal, a woman, took him under her wing and gave him an hour of, of English, or I should say Hebrew lessons every day. And then, of course, he's interacting with his friends, all in, you know, who all speak Hebrew. Right. And it, in his grade two class, and uh, by March he was fluent, and by June he was in the top five in his class. Uh, our second son, Jess, and our daughter, Kate, they, they came through Gina, through um, kindergarten, and so they picked up Hebrew, you know, as naturally as they spoke English. Kathy became very fluent in Hebrew very quickly because she was doing all the family business, the grocery shopping and whatever, uh, interacting with neighbors. I was the slow guy. Uh, I'd taken Hebrew in university, but you know I was biblical right. Hebrew, so it took right. a while for me to catch on to the English or to the uh, modern Hebrew. And I'm still not very good at it. But uh, a year and a half in, um, we planted. You know, <laughs> uh, at that time we call it JCA, J uh, Jerusalem Christian Assembly, in an apartment, and uh, so we founded it on that day in August of '83. And then a week or so later, Wayne and Ann Hilson came and joined us as um, co-pastors and co-founders. And um, the rest is history. It eventually became a king of kings. I know it, it, uh, it never stopped growing. It still hasn't stopped growing. Uh, it's a very live and vital uh, church uh, with uh, huge impact. About 12 congregations meet in the, uh, in, in the facility that's been built. And uh, there's a university now that started in, in my office. Um, there's um, a huge social justice ministry, a big media ministry, and then a very large ministry that is coordinating a number of um, Israeli ministries in uh, Israel called uh, FIRM, Fellowship of Israel-Related Ministries. Yes. So, so you know, uh, again, that's just a kind of a snapshot, but, um, you know, people have often asked me, so why aren't you still there? Why did you leave? I mean, most preachers would give their eye teeth to preach once in Jerusalem. But my answer is very clear. The Lord called me as a pioneer, as a planter, as a seed scatterer, if you will. My job was to get it established, to get the DNA right, mm -hmm. and to bring it to bring in people that uh, eventually would do a better job than I would have done. And uh, the Hillsons were number one, but then we, we trained a number of Jewish believers as pastors, and 
uh, the upshot of it is that it has been not just a sustainable ministry, but a, a thriving ministry. That's amazing. And uh, King of Kings, of course, is a key partner for for us in uh, in Jerusalem and has been for Clyde and Marion Williamson for over 30 years now. Um, it was kind of out of the, the prayer tower and, and all of all of that, that uh, really the ministry of first century grew and uh, used to be called Operation Outreach, as you probably know. And uh, so we love to hear the story of the founding of the ministry. Wayne has shared it from his perspective, but I wanted to hear it from, uh, from you today as well. And uh, I, it, I'm glad you answered the question about, you know, why am I not still there? Because, of course, I was going to say, so, so, you know, what is, that, what is that about? You know, you, you go, you plant, and I certainly fully understand your question uh, here, or your answer, I should say, but, but here is something that, um, that maybe I'll, I'll pivot off of, and that is this. What, what does that uh, initial call to, to Israel, that initial call to the city of Jerusalem, how, does, how has that played out throughout the rest of your life and ministry? Because I know that, uh, I know that Israel never leaves you. Um, uh, what kind of impact has that had in an ongoing way? Well, first of all, just on a very personal level, uh, you know, if you ask me where, my, where our family hometown is, my answer is Jerusalem. Hmm. Uh, we, ra- we raised our kids there, and uh, all three of them are in, they're pastors, all three of them are in the ministry today. Um, and all three of them, when they were married, uh, they took their new uh, spouses to Jerusalem on their honeymoon to show them their hometown. So on a personal level, Jerusalem is our hometown. Uh, whenever I'm back, and I get back quite, quite often, I just pick up where I left off. It's hilarious, you know, I'll sometimes walk down um, uh, the, the Ben Yehuda Mall, and there's a, there's a few uh, uh, merchants there who uh, sell various things. And uh, they were there when I lived there, and they're still there now. And no yeah. kidding, this has happened more than once. I'll be walking by, or I'll stop and look at them eye to eye. Jim! How are you? I haven't seen you for a while. Where have you been? Uh, you know, in, in, in Jerusalem, That's they're great. so used to a diplomatic travel, people going away with the government for five years at a time, mm-hmm. that it's, it, it just, it's, not, it's a matter of crush to them for a person to be away for a few years and to come back. And this is a part of the, the phenomenon. And then, of course, you know, walking those streets, I'm walking the same pavements that I walked when I was... Uh, pastoring, planting a church and pastoring there and, and you know, with my kids in, in, in hand. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it, it's the only city in the world that uh, has that kind of um, uh, historical presence. Um, it's not just old, it's ancient. And when something is ancient, it doesn't change much, even over the course of 40 years. Yeah, yeah. But then in terms of, apart from that personal aspect, in terms of um, the work that you know we've been doing subsequently, um, I've always felt uh, like I've come into you know North America and now through media to the rest of the world out of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like I'm a part of that calling for the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Um, I'll always feel that way uh, because my ministry um, roots became very deeply transplanted in Jerusalem and will be there forever. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that way too, even just since my first trip there. Uh, I had no idea where the Lord would uh, lead us to to the point that we're at now, but uh, it's just one of those places that gets in your heart and in your spirit. Um, yeah. So you came back from, from Jerusalem and Tell me, what, what was the next sort of step of your ministry journey? I know you're involved in, in TV for quite some time. Did you go immediately to that? No, for about eight months, I itinerated on, on behalf of uh, King of Kings uh, all across Canada. And we were based out of London, Ontario. And uh, then um, while I was doing that, I got a call from David Maines, who is well known in Canada. Um, he has uh, gone to be with the Lord a few years ago, but he established a ministry called Crossroads Christian Communications, and they had a national Christian television show called 100 Huntley Street, and a daily show, uh, very high profile. And he contacted me and asked me if I would be his senior associate. And I felt from the Lord I should do that. I had done a lot of TV work with him before going to Israel, 
And then, of course, in Israel, I was doing radio all of the time. And then Kathy was a newscaster there on television. So we were, you know, very media savvy and had a sense of the Lord that media was a part of his calling on our lives. So anyway, I agreed to do it. And, and for eight years, Dave and I worked together. And then I, I felt the Lord leading me uh, into um, pastoring again for a period of time. And so I, I pastored Broadway Church in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, for two and a half years. And while I was there, the Lord uh, exposed me to the ravages of HIV and AIDS among the mainly Aboriginal women in East Vancouver. And I had had no exposure really to HIV and AIDS uh, until that point in time, but I was very involved in East Vancouver with our church and ministry there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I began to research HIV and AIDS and I discovered it was the biggest orphan and widowmaker in the history of mankind. And I, I was so impacted by that truth in Psalm 68 verse five, where it says, God is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows in his holy habitation. And I sense the Lord was calling me out of that very affluent, you know, um, um, anchor type church into another period of um, trailblazing. Uh, in this case, uh, on behalf of orphans and widows in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I had a connection with Sub-Saharan Africa because while I was pastoring in Jerusalem, the Assemblies of God in South Africa used to bring me down to do major conferences and conventions out of Jerusalem. So there was already kind of a network of uh, pastors, young pastors there, who right. looked up to me as an older guy who, you know, uh, they would like to emulate in terms of church planning. And uh, so I had a natural connection, and it was through that I, I began... Uh, I, I resigned Broadway Church and I began a ministry called Vision Led, which now is known as WOW, Working for Orphans and Widows. And uh, uh, for 21 years now, we've been very involved with uh, thousands of orphans and widows. And interestingly, uh, a lot of the orphans we dealt with 21 years ago are now young adults, uh, teachers, lawyers, doctors, pastors, uh, whose lives were utterly and totally transformed by the gospel. That's and amazing. who are now themselves giving back and administering to the next generation of orphans and widows under our umbrella. That's amazing. Fantastic. And you are still uh, the founder and president of that organization. You're continuing work with them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I live in denial. I'm 73. I think I'm 43 and uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking to that. I, <laughs> I, I have no sense at all of slowing down or uh, of any compression of vision uh, I've got a bigger horizon I'm pursuing now than I ever have in my whole life. And so I'm just loving life and embracing it. That's great. But you've done some side projects along the way as well. I uh, uh, have seen you on a, a show you did with, um, I'm trying to remember the organization you did it with, but it was kind of a devotional uh, through Israel uh, not that many years ago. Yeah, right? that, that was with uh, Day of Discovery. Um, okay. Yeah, they, they contacted me. Uh, this was Day of Discovery Canada. It was also Day of Discovery USA. The USA had decided they would no longer do television work. They had done it for many years. But in Canada, they wanted to give one final kick at the can. And so they asked me if I would uh, do 26 shows for them on location in Israel, just walking through um, those locations uh, relating it to the scriptures. Um, and uh, I agreed to do it. It was in the height of, height of summer. We did 26 shows in 12 days. Uh, oh, boy. It nearly, nearly killed me. I, when, when we were down in Kumar. 12 days, Jim. Yeah, 12 days, 26 shows uh, with a full camera crew. You can imagine. And traveling around Israel. When we were down in uh, Qumran, it was um, uh, Fahrenheit. It was, uh, uh, shoot, what was it? It was, uh, well, Fahrenheit, it was 124 degrees. That's what it was. Oh, my goodness. And I had to climb that hill behind Qumran about halfway up because they wanted to have a certain perspective of the cameras. Right. And um, I thought that was going to be my last walk. <laughs> 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 I, when, I got, when I got back uh, from doing that uh, day of shooting, I, I wasn't sure that I would see the next day. And wow. then, you know, in the upper Galilee, it wasn't much better. I mean, uh, anywhere around the Sea of Galilee, it's subtropical, as you know. And so the temperature was, as it was in Qumran, but having said that, uh, that series was very well received. It's still available out there, uh, just Dave Discovery. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that they'll be able to um, uh, run it again in some context. They've actually given me permission to put it on my own website, which I'm going to do. But it was, it was terrific. I loved that experience. 
Well, listen, let me, uh, let me ask you something because, um, you know, our ministry, First Century Foundations, and I, I, I know you're familiar, uh, your son Jess was connected a little bit when he was fundraising to, to go back to Jerusalem. And uh, he, by the way, is a, is a pastor here in my hometown now. I live in Barrie. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that. yeah. We had already been, uh, we had already been attending uh, the other church when, uh, when Jess came, but uh, we've had a chance to connect. I did a podcast with him, believe it or not, a couple of weeks ago, but I forgot to press record, so I have to do it all again. So uh, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it happened oh, to me. I can entertain you with all kinds of things that have happened with live television, believe me. <laughs> I'd love to hear some of those. I'd love to hear some of those. But what I was going to say is, uh, you know, I, I know that um, because of your connection with Israel, because of uh, your your time spent there and your passion to get uh, what was eventually King of Kings up and running and, and founded and established. I know that uh, that reaching the Jewish and the Arab people who live there uh, still has to be something that's uh, that's deep in your heart. If you were to talk to our viewers and and say to Christians, especially in North America today. Um, why it's important to take a stand for Israel, to bless Israel. Uh, what would you say to them? Well, you know, to me, it's a no-brainer. Uh, it's not a political thing. Uh, it's not even a religious thing. Um, our Savior, Jesus, yes. was a Jew. Mm -hmm. The apostles were all Jewish. The writers of the New Testament were all Jewish, as were the writers of the Old Testament, with the exception in the New Testament of Luke, who was a Gentile physician. Um, our whole concept of um, sin, um, salvation, uh, atonement, uh, justification, sanctification, uh, our theology, uh, our, our, our worldview is all rooted in uh, the Jewish scriptures. Um, and if you, you know, if you try to uh, remove uh, your faith as a Christian from your Jewish roots, you essentially uh, cut it off at the roots and the whole thing dies. Hmm. Um, so um, when it comes to Israel, to me, it's a no brainer. I, you know, I'm, I, I had as, you know, I had some very straightforward conversations with Jewish friends and, and colleagues when we lived in Jerusalem. Uh, I had a lot of uh, uh, politicians, uh, professors, uh, um, men and women in the arts, and also in the uh, Jerusalem Rotary Club who were friends of mine. And, you know, so it was a kind of high level conversations I was having, but um, I, 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 would, I would raise the issues, uh, you know, of, apparent injustices that some uh, Israeli policies were creating in, in the Middle East. I also had a number of Arab friends and we would talk about it from the Arab perspective, but I'd always bring it back to, this is a temporal conversation. This is a current political reality that will probably in time change for better or for worse, usually for worse. But ultimately um, my interest is um, our relationship with um, the God of Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, and Ishmael, okay? Uh, he, he, is, he is the father of the faithful. And um, our issue is how do we deal with, with um, uh, this Lord of all? And I, I remember a conversation I had one time, Kathy and I, with um, uh, uh, three professors from the Hebrew University and uh, one of the cabinet ministers from the Israeli government, and we were all together in a social event. And um, the question is, was often asked of us, what are, you, what, are you, what are you doing here? You're just a young couple with young kids. You know, you, you leave Canada, and, and, and you, why, why are you here? And I would explain to them without being pious, that I was here because I felt that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their God, had by his spirit called me to come to Jerusalem to um, proclaim um, the scriptures, uh, both old and new scriptures. And um, I was just simply being obedient, if you will, to a heavenly calling. And I remember one of the professors, he was the um, Arabist at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He, he was a worldwide expert on uh, Arab issues. 
uh, he was uh, a Jewish, an Orthodox Jew, and his wife in a silence, because always when I would talk this way, there'd be total silence. I mean, everybody would be silent and looking down. Hmm. She looked up at me and says, Jim, I think you're more Jewish than the rest of us. <laughs> and, you know, she wasn't joking. Right. Uh, it, it's, you know, um, this whole scripture about uh, Gentile faith sometimes provoking the jealousy uh, those in Israel who may have uh, wandered from their faith, I think there's something to it. But what I, what I did discover in all my years in, in Israel with my Jewish friends was the truth of uh, that scripture uh, from Isaiah when he talks about a bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench. It doesn't matter how secular uh, th th that Jewish person is. When you talk to them about the ways of the Lord, it's like uh, the wind of the Spirit blows on that smoking flax and a flame emerges. Hmm. It creates, in many cases, great discomfort for them. Right. It's not the kind of discomfort that um, produces defensiveness. Uh, it produces soul-searching and tears. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's really good. You know, we, um, one of the things that I do when I'm allowed to uh, move about the country, uh, uh, this this season, this year has been very interesting for all of us. Mm. But uh, when I can get in and, and speak with churches, I'm, I'm challenging, you know, Christians to give, give uh, room for this thought, you know, that, that Jesus is our Jewish Messiah, and that uh, the roots of faith uh, speak and and help us to understand uh, even the New Testament in a much better way. I know that uh, you know this. You're working on a, a commentary right now, a, a casual commentary. I think you called it. You can talk about that in a second. But but I know that that you understand that you know. First of all, the places that are spoken of in the Bible are real, and we can go and we can stand in those places and and we can be where Jesus was. But also, uh, the context out of which they were written helps to inform. Uh, what what it was that Jesus was saying to us. And sometimes we have so North Americanized uh, or contextualized the scripture that we're not really even fully understand what Jesus is saying. Is that Would that be accurate? Well, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I've, I've encountered people who are uh, astonished, shocked even to hear me say Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, I remember one woman saying, well, no, 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 Jesus was Christian. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there's a basic ignorance right there that is just phenomenal to me. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the contextualization of Christianity is something that we're all guilty of. Uh, and I think, you know, the Apostle Paul, uh, thank God he, he did this in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, now we see through a glass darkly. Now we know in part. In other words, none of us has full, clear um, insight into right. the ways and the purpose uh, of, of God in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, each of us is uh, suffering from a uh, uh, kind of a hermeneutical astigmatism. We, we, we interpret, and, 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 and the very act of interpretation uh, is, is flawed. Um, and, and so to uh, be dogmatic about our, our flawed interpretation uh, is counterproductive, to say the least, and foolish. On the other hand, uh, if, you, if you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, slash Acts, because Acts is part two of Luke and John, and that's what I've covered in my uh, book, which is coming out very soon, called Candelon's Casual Commentary. Uh, when, when you study just those Gospels, uh, without um, a... Uh, uh, a North American contextual bias. And I think it's possible to do that, especially, well, certainly from my perspective, having lived there for as long as I did. I mean, I, these, these place names, you know, these settings mm -hmm. uh, are all three-dimensional for me. Um, I, I, I know them, you know, I, I can smell them, I feel them. Anyway, to the extent that you're able to, to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and John, just as a, an objective reader, uh, you see Jesus in a light that perhaps you've not seen him before. Um, you know, he's not the Jesus of the, of the, of the uh, paintings, you know, the Jesus hanging on a cross on the top of a hill with two crosses beside him. You realize that he was probably crucified at eye level, right at the base of 
Calvary, the, the stoning ground, the place where people were crucified so that uh, the Romans could increase their suffering by having people walk right by, look in the eye and spit in their face. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you begin to, uh, the Sea of Galilee takes on a different tone. Uh, the settings of Jesus' ministry, the importance of Capernaum, uh, and, and, and also you get exposed to the uh, constant stress that Jesus was under from crowds and crowds and crowds of people who wanted healing. It was like he was a, a, a wandering uh, health clinic. Uh, people weren't really interested in what he had to say. They were interested in what he could do for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, you begin to see this. and You, you see Jesus uh, handling these stressful situations uh, in such a remarkable fashion. You see the gap of understanding between Jesus and his disciples. Right to the end, the disciples didn't get it. They were religious, religious nationalists. They, they wanted Jesus to establish uh, the, uh, the kingdom in Jerusalem and rule the world, and they would be his cabinet. Right. You know, even to one point where James and John had their mother lobbying with Jesus to get one on the right and one on the left when he finally set up his government. Um, even after the resurrection, when he bring, asked them to come up and meet him in the Galilee, some of them come up there still doubting. You know, uh, it, it, so if, if, you, if you just look at the Gospels, you know, and forget about all the other stuff that has come with it in your upbringing in church and or in your listening to tele televangelists or you're reading various Christian authors. If you, if you just try to approach the Gospels uh, person to person, uh, Jesus will take on a, a, uh, a persona and a signature that perhaps will totally take you by surprise. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Now on the on the flip side, so so help me with this because I you know I debate this with people all the time. It's important for us to understand our Jewish roots. It's important for us to understand the context from which Jesus was coming. Um, in your estimation, uh, does that mean that we have to throw out hundreds of years of of Christian orthodoxy, or can we find some balance there? Well. That, that's a question that uh, is a kind of a close-ended question. Um, if you do any reading in church history at all, or in just in world history at all, mm -hmm. you discover that uh, orthodoxy means one thing in one century and means another thing in another century, and even in the same century, it means a different thing in this region and in that region. Orthodoxy is a work in progress. Uh, there, there, there is an orthodoxy that we, we say is the current orthodoxy, but uh, really orthodoxy is, uh, is a moving target. Um, secondly, um, we need to have appreciation for the development of the canon of scripture. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the canon of Jewish scripture was not really established by Jewish consent till between 90 AD and 120 AD. And, and, and Christian canon was not really established in terms of through common usage until about 200 AD, and it was not formalized till about 400 AD. And, and in, the, in, in the process, you've got all these various books, various orthodoxies uh, coming at you. You've got, you got uh, uh, Hellenized worldviews, you've got Gnosticism, you have, you have Egyptian mythology, you've got uh, Persian mythologies, and, and, and all these poor people, you know, who are now being presented with the gospel, they don't have the written scriptures uh, to work with, and so they've got all these pressures coming in on them, and here's the Apostle Paul coming in and uh, representing uh, the, the words of Christ to them, and, and, and then as the centuries unfolded, you've got uh, various church councils, Constantine played a huge role in bringing uh, con councils together of various bishops and the, 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 the development of sort of basic orthodoxies. And even as those orthodoxies were, were established, you had splits. And so you got Western Orthodoxy, you got Eastern Orthodoxy, you've got Coptic Orthodoxies. Um, so, you know, the word orthodox is, is a loaded, loaded word. Um, so th this brings me again back to the Gospels. Uh, what are the Gospels about? Well, first of all, gospel comes from a uh, Greek word evangelion, which, or evangelion, which basically means uh, good news or glad tidings. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it related to anything that was good news. It wasn't just um, the news of Jesus. It was the news about the weather. You know, it's going to be right. a great day today. Oh, that's, that's, that's good news. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, 
in, in, in the Gospels, you, you, you have the good news that in this huge kaleidoscopic confusion of orthodoxies out there, there is the brilliant light of God's love for the world in becoming flesh and dwelling among us full of grace and truth, becoming incarnate in a stable in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, and then being crucified in Jerusalem and then rising from the dead, ascending to the Father with the promise that he's coming back. Mm -hmm. And critical to all of that, and this is why the Gospels are really important, and the Apostle Paul makes this point in 1 Corinthians 15, critical to all of this is the story of the resurrection. Uh, everything, pivots, everything pivots on the resurrection. Forget about orthodoxies out there. Everything pivots on the resurrection. If Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain, Paul said. And he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the thing about the resurrection is it happened in history. It's not, you know, some weird mystical thinker who had an apple hit him in the head and had this vision of the heavenlies. This is an actual historical event. And the grave is empty. Uh, and whenever I, you know, and I, I, you know, I got a brain, so do you. Uh, I've got an education, so do you. And, and, and I interact with thousands of people, so do you. Um, I, I could not be a Christian if it were not for the fact that he has risen. Hmm. But because he has risen, I'm able then to connect the dots. And and the and the if you will the I won't call it the orthodoxy but the 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 theological um, infrastructure of old and new testaments um, makes sense. Yeah, it's good. I just uh, deal with lots of questions from people, you know, about uh, all of the the Jewish roots. You you go in and, and you talk about some of these things, and suddenly. Um, you know, you, you find groups of people that uh, don't want to have Christmas trees anymore, don't want to celebrate Christmas. The Bible didn't tell us to celebrate the birth of Jesus, and on and on and on it goes, right? You've, you've come across these people as well. Uh, you, know, you know what? When, when uh, our very first uh, Christmas with um, our congregation in Jerusalem, I brought in a tree <laughs> and, and had it decorated. And, and uh, the, the, you know, some some of the some of the Jewish believers, you know, thought they should be offended, <laughs> right, right. and some of them were offended. And I said, yeah. "Excuse me, I'm a Christian. That's what we do. All right." Yeah. So take it or leave it. Now, fortunately for me, um, and I, uh, I got to be careful how I say this, but I know how to push back, uh, and and th th this 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 got me a long way in in, in Israel. Mm -hmm. In Israel, if you don't know how to push back, they don't respect you. Right. And I found this behind closed doors with government, you know, and with anti-missionary groups and all kinds of people who tried to give me big trouble over those initial years. You had to know how to push back. Well, I pushed back. I said, come on, this is what we do. Call it a Hanukkah bush, but the tree stays. <laughs> and, you know, eventually, <laughs> eventually, <laughs> not just Jewish believers, but also secular Jews showing up with the carol books. Okay. Wanting to, sing, wanting to sing carols because many of them, you know, were born and raised in North America and now they've made Aliyah to Israel. And, right. But they say, they say, Jim, you know, there's nothing like the, like the Christmas carols. I mean, they're the most beautiful songs we've ever sung. And so I remember one time in our, our apartment or our flat in, uh, in uh, uh, the German colony in Jerusalem, we had about 22 um, secular Israelis with us uh, gathered around our our Christmas tree and Kathy on their piano singing Old Little Town of Bethlehem. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, I, I try and, and sort of find that, that even keel ground with people and, and just help them to understand that uh, first of all, that as, as Gentiles, we're not called to be Jewish. Uh, we're called to follow the Jewish Messiah. You know, we, we are not, uh, we're not to, do everything that we can to to sort of become uh, Jewish, and uh, and the same you know goes for the the Jews. The Jews don't have to become Christian in the sense that they follow every single one of our traditions. They they can see the Messiah in the appointed times of the Lord and and continue to be Jewish in in that sense. I think that's a real possibility. You know, if there's one thing that that Israelis respect, 
it's authenticity. Right. You got to be who you are. Mm. If you're not who you are, they, they smell it right away. Exactly. If you're if you're approaching them with an agenda or with a kind of a two-faced uh, persona, uh, you you set yourself up for um, ridicule. Um, you just got to be who you are. Now, again, <laughs> I remember the very first. Um, uh, conference that Wayne Hilton and I attended shortly after they had arrived to work with us. Uh, we went to a conference of uh, various congregations from around uh, Israel of Jewish believers and uh, incorporated into all of these groups, of course, were Gentiles. Um, and we'd come to these conferences and the ones wearing kippot and uh, talif and uh, looking very Jewish were always Gentiles. Interesting. Uh, yeah, the Jews, the Jews were just themselves. The Israelis were just themselves. You know, uh, dressing up doesn't get you anywhere. Covering up doesn't get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing about the gospel. The gospel is in your face. The gospel is an offense to some. It's a blessing to others. But let the gospel be the gospel. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you, if you take some hits, you take some hits. Right. I mean, I mean who, who doesn't take hits for, for, for conviction? And for faith and for belief, that, that's just the way it goes. But to try to be what you're not is a sure, slippery slope. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Jim, thank you so much for uh, taking some time with us today. I really appreciate being able to have this conversation and uh, reminiscing uh, about your time in Israel. That's been, that's been uh, fun for me to, to listen to and to hear. And um, I just... Uh, Pray blessing on everything that you're continuing to do through uh, through Wow in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a wonderful ministry, as you know. We, as a church, when I was pastoring, uh, followed along with you and and got involved yeah. in a Christmas project every year, and and just it was fantastic. So, so God bless you for all that you're doing, and uh, thanks for taking the time with us today. Jeff, I, I thank you, and I might say for those who want to follow me, uh, I have a television program which is also on the internet. Uh, jimcantillontoday.com, jimcantillontoday.com. You can see all of my TV shows for the last four years. Uh, and wildmission.com also will connect you with our work um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and India. But I would say this too, Jeff. Um, Clyde Williamson, the founder of your ministry, uh, is a long-term friend of mine. And um, at a critical moment in my son Jess's life, as he was following the Lord's leading in terms of his ministry in Israel, uh, Clyde went to bat for him and uh, was very, very, very helpful to Jess in terms of providing him a kind of a covering for the ministry that he was uh, doing there. And so I have uh, great regard for your work. Well, we have great regard for it as well in terms of what Clyde and Marion together have built. Uh, we wanted this year to celebrate them and their 35 years of, of going back and forth to Israel and being involved in ministry there. They are, are beginning to transition into a season of, of uh, semi-retirement after this year. And uh, so it's uh, been unfortunate that COVID has happened because we've not been able to have that, that public celebration. And, uh, but we honor them. And, and uh, I know, I know that uh, none of uh, this, this vision is here without them. And uh, grateful that, you know, God called us alongside to be a part of this and, and to uh, be able to carry it into the future. And I, I pray, I pray that this ministry that they have so meticulously and carefully built and, and put together will uh, continue to thrive and even grow uh, as we move into the future. So we're just praying that uh, God will continue to help us to help all of these ministries in the land of Israel. And uh, there's over 70 now that, uh, you know, that we're trying to do that for and just grateful that we can be involved. Yeah, that's terrific. Well, the Lord bless you, bless you. Shalom. Thank you, Jim. Shalom. Have a wonderful day. Well, thanks for tuning into the podcast today. It was great for me to be able to reconnect with Jim Canelon. Hadn't spoken to him in quite some time. And I hope you enjoyed listening in on our conversation. Wonderful to hear about the early days of his time in Jerusalem and the founding of King of Kings community. And also to get his perspective on what it means as believers for us to be able to make a connection with Israel, to bless and support Israel. I also found it refreshing to hear his thoughts on how the Hebraic roots helps to 
inform us in our faith, but how that we need to also maintain a, a balance of being who we are in Christ and uh, as part of the Gentile Christian Church. I think that uh, we've all maybe just gotten another perspective today, and uh, none of these thoughts are definitively right or definitively wrong, but I hope that you've enjoyed listening and, and hearing those perspectives. I would remind you about the projects that Jim mentioned. He has a television show, Jim Cantillon Today, and the website for that is jimcantillontoday.com. And also, if you want to know about their work in sub-Saharan Africa, working with those who are suffering from HIV AIDS, then uh, you can check out wowmission.com stands for Working with Widows and Orphans, and it's a great organization. I encourage you to check that out. Lastly, watch for his book, Cantillon's Casual Commentary, and uh, I don't know how you can get that, but I know that information will be coming out, and so if you just kind of keep your eyes and ears peeled, I'm sure you'll be able to learn something about that. Um, Remember, we're a ministry, First Century Foundations, that works with over 70 different ministries in the land of Israel. And so we want to just encourage you, if it is in your heart to help ministries in Israel, then would you donate? We're a charity here in Canada and in the U.S., and you can donate at our website, firstcenturyfoundations.com forward slash donate, and all of your gifts will go towards the Ministry of First Century Foundations and help us to help ministries in the land of Israel that uh, are so in need, especially during this time of COVID-19. And so uh, thank you very much for tuning in today. Pleasure to have you with us on the podcast. And remember, as Christians, we stand with Israel.